Joel, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about something. Uh, these are my disclosures. I think we all know that there are large institutional databases that have shown that many of our dislocating hip have perfect cup positions. And the question has always been, why is that? And I think we started by thinking about that maybe that's related to the pelvis position. If I put it in a certain anatomic position, maybe that's not going to work for every pelvis. And what do I mean with that? There are patients that have a neutral pelvis. Some people have an anterior tilt of their pelvis. Some people have a posterior tilt. And you might imagine if I have an anterior tilt and I put the cup in a certain position that the hip has a higher tendency to dislocate in the back. And so we started like this. And if you see this, it's tilted forward. There's no antiversion, no functional antiversion. And as the pelvis rolls back, you start to get much more, much more antiversion, much more functional antiversion. Now important is that the anatomic antiversion, if you use something like also line or so, will be exactly the same no matter what that pelvis is. It always looks the same. We didn't change the cup when we just showed that to you here. So now one of the dilemmas is that pelvic tilt doesn't change. What I see before the surgery is usually what I'm going to see after surgery. So I have to take it into consideration to some extent. And it's quite interesting. If I have a pelvis that is all the way rolled back in a standing position, my functional antiversion will be almost 40 degrees even if I anatomically put it in at 20 degrees. So that patient will be at much higher risk of anterior dislocation, while the other way around, they could be at much higher uh, risk of posterior dislocation, depending on where that functional antiversion is. And I think the question that we ask ourselves when we do anterior hip replacement, is that really something we have to think about if we use a CM? And the good news is, no, that's why I love the CM. You don't even have to think about everything I said here, because if the patient lays on the table, and the CM image looks like your x-ray before surgery, you just put the cup where you think it should be with the appropriate antiversion that you like, whether it's 15 degrees or whatever, and it will automatically take into consideration what your functional antiversion has to be. So if I look at this patient, I look at this patient and I do a CM image. Now I'm not going to put the cup as flat as this, I'm going to have a little ellipse as Morris Tanner just showed, and that's going to be my 15 degrees of antiversion. In reality, I now increase that patient's anatomic antiversion. And the other way around, if I have a patient like this that lays on the table like this, I would decrease my antiversion here. So I would decrease the anatomic antiversion in order to do that. So that's one of the beauties of the CM. And sagittal deformity is not the only thing we look at. This is a beautiful patient. I ended up, <laughs> I caused her to dislocate. Why? I figured that out later. She didn't just have a rollback, which increased her antiversion, but she also has a scoliosis that tilts her pelvis on the actual plane out. So I even increase her functional antiversion more just by having her stick out that side of the pelvis. And so we need some kind of software that tells us how much extra rotation is. We have developed one. I think we're a little late for the Shark Tank this year. Maybe we come next year for this. So what I'm trying to say here is if you use a CM, everything I said right now, you don't have to think about. You just put the cup where it looks good. But if you want to use navigation, any of these techniques, you have to do the math in the back of your head because what you see is oriented on the anatomic plane, not on the plane where the pelvis actually stands when the patient gets up. And that's something that's difficult to do. The other thing that influences risk of dislocation is spinal fusion and stiffness in the spine. We all know if I have a spinal fusion, my risk of dislocation goes up tremendously. But how does that all work and how can I judge that risk? Now one of the issues is if the spine is stiff, my hip has to flex more. So if I have a stiff spine, my hip flexes more, with that comes more risk of dislocating. So if you look at this, I have a normal spine flexibility, the spine actually moves with it, with it and it does give us some of the flexion of the hip. Well, if I don't, if I have a stiff spine, the hip just has to move more and that drives dislocation. Now, what can we look at? We can look at sacral slope and pelvic tilt and I think you all know what that is. That's pretty simple classification of what's the sagittal position of the pelvis. And we can go one step further, and we can take the same x-ray in a standing position and in a sitting position. And we can see how these two variables change. And you don't have to be both because their relationship to each other doesn't change. So most of us just look at the sacral slope and we see if it changes. And if there is a significant amount of change, we call that rollback and we think that's good because that protects our hip from actually dislocating. And there's now softwares that do that automatically like ours and you know about this. So now what that means is if my pelvis in this case here doesn't roll back, like it's at 49 standing, 53 sitting, then my hip has to move 10 degrees more, in that case even 13 degrees more, to get into a sitting position. And that means it's at risk to dislocate. And that's the first part of Jonathan Vigdorczyk's
uh, you know, awarded a hip spine classification. It simply looks at whether the, the, the pelvis rolls back when you sit down, because that would protect the hip from dislocating. And it says if it doesn't roll back, so the ones that don't have sacral slope change, you actually increase your antiversion. Now, what else can we look at? We can look at lumbar lordosis, and we can look at pelvic incidence, because the flat back is ultimately defined by both, and I'm going to explain that in a second here. Now, this is Jonathan's classification. It just doesn't look at whether there is rollback. It also looks at if you have a stiff spine, a flat spine. And what does that mean? Now, let's look at this patient here. It has a pelvic incidence. Why is that pelvic incidence so important? Because pelvic incidence, if it's larger, it drives the spine forward. If you then lack the ability to correct it by adding lordosis, you actually end up in this forward position where the anterior spine, everything is tilting forward. Now, if you now, dis if you now want to sit down and you don't have rollback, can you imagine now the following happens? This is the position it's in. And now I'm showing you the same video as before. It's lacking 20 degrees to further flex the hip. So that's why these two Bs are such a disaster. But as Morris Tanner pointed out correctly, there's really not a lot we can do. We can dial in a little bit more antiversion. But the one important thing that Jonathan pointed out, it's no longer about the anatomic plane. It's about the functional plane of the pelvis. And many of us look at this and don't really know what that means. But I think that's an important thing. So does that really matter for us anterior surgeons? You know, I have to say, dislocation is not a big problem in my practice. And it also applies to all my other colleagues at HSS that do anti-hip replacements. We don't have high dislocation rates. I believe if I use a C-arm, I put my cup at 15 to 20 degrees of antiversion, I close my anterior capsule, uh, I don't have to worry about the stiff spine classification. You know, but one thing, the two Bs might be an exception here. And I'm going to show you an example, a woman I saw two weeks ago in my practice, bone on bone arthritis, a 2B spine, and that's her clinical examination. She had total knees by Russ Windsor that hyperextend that much. I mean, he's one of the best knee surgeons in the country. I was one, unfortunately. Um, he rests in peace. But this is, um, you know, this is her range of motion, almost like a normal hip. I mean, how are you going to keep that hip stable? That will need something more than just a little bit more antiversion. That might need a dual mobility liner. So in summary, I think standing to sitting x-rays are probably not needed for most of the anterior hips that you do with the C-arm. I'm only talking about when you use the C-arm for cup position. Adjust the cup position to pelvic tilt is an automatic process whenever I use my C-arm. That's why I love the C-arm. That's why I love technology that's based on the C-arm. And you might not like the radiation, but it makes a lot of things much easier. Dislocation is extremely rare. So while I measure um, a pelvic rollback on all my patients, I get sitting and standing x-rays. I have to say that for the majority of patients, I don't need it. There's probably a few two Bs that I personally can probably identify clinically already, uh, and there are probably ways to do that, that would benefit from this entire workup that we have talked about right now. But in general, if you use a C-arm, you put your cup at 20 degrees antiversion, you do a good job with your soft tissue releases, and don't excessively release. Please forget everything I just talked about, and thank you very much.